comfortable place to sit and read, although uh, this is really a winter quarters rather than uh, the summer places I've been round about here. But anyway, here we are in front of the old family fireplace. The unusual privilege when doing it here of having a little dram to hand. We have here a bottle of the Uchadal, Ardbeg Uchadal, which I brought out specially for this because it is, in my opinion, the best whisky ever made. And I will put the bottle over here and take a small sip of this glass of it. So, Slanja, Nastarovia, Chaz. That is absolutely delicious. Set us up for the ordeal ahead. Right, here we have Statesman of Europe about Sir Edward Grey by T.G. Otty. This rather substantial volume, Sir Edward Grey, the man who stood at the window of the Foreign Office on the evening of Monday, 4th of August, 1914, looking down at Birdcage Walk, some hours after the German army had crossed into Belgium, waiting for an ultimatum, waiting for a German response to a British ultimatum to withdraw, to come from Berlin, and he observed to somebody who was there with him the famous remark about the lamps going out all over Europe that is quoted right at the beginning of this film, and I wanted to start by just reading T.G. Otty's account of that moment. He says, During the night, the German army had advanced onto Belgian soil. The war in the West had begun. Now, ministers agreed to instruct Goshen at Berlin to lodge a formal protest against the violation of international treaties and to demand that the assault on Belgium be halted. You should ask for an immediate reply, a follow-up telegram dispatched at 2 p.m. specified, and saying that if no satisfactory reply was received from the German government by midnight, the ambassador was to break off relations. Britain would then take all steps in her power to uphold the neutrality of Belgium. It was an ultimatum, and there could be no doubt that Britain was now expecting to be at war at midnight. As the clock ran down on Britain's ultimatum that evening, Grey was standing at a window in his room at the Foreign Office overlooking St James's Park. It was dusk now, and the lamps were being lit down below on Birdcage Walk. Jay Spender, the editor of the Westminster Gazette, was with him. The lamps are going out all over Europe, Gray said to him. We shall not see them lit again in our lifetime. Later still, Gray sat with Asquith, Churchill, Haldane, Lloyd George and then Harcourt in the cabinet room at number 10 Downing Street, waiting. The mood was sombre and funereal. It felt like a wake. There was no reply from Berlin. So, when this book arrived, my first thought was to wonder what it said about the theory that Grey was responsible for having given the, the French ideas about British assistance in the, in the event of a conflict which would have emboldened them to attack Germany uh, when in other circumstances they might not have done. Was he a sort of uh, latent or brainwashed tutophobe? Or did he conspire to provoke war in order to crush Germany as a competitive world market, which is another conspiracy theory that's been bruited about? So I skipped over his ancestry and I opened the book at page 16 to find out what sort of childhood he had. Three weeks later, I closed it after reading this paragraph, the very last one in the book, on page 687. Edward Grey was a pragmatist but a principled one, and that made him a visionary. He foresaw the catastrophe of war and strove to forestall it, even if he ultimately failed. 
He advanced a policy of arbitration and cooperation that foreshadowed 20th century forms of international governance. He foresaw the corrosive effects of class and pursued domestic reforms to improve social conditions and to enhance democratic accountability. He had a realistic appreciation of the strengths and limitations of Britain's international position and he practised a coherent and engaged foreign policy that accepted Britain's historic European and global role. Out of office, in the aftermath of the Great War, he also began to advocate the importance of environmental concerns. Gray was a man of his times, of course, but in so many respects he still speaks to the concerns of today. And I hadn't planned to read this, but I'll just um, uh, note that the concerns of today include what he, he said, the, the immediate sentence above it, because uh, Professor Otty says that Gray, the countryman, rooted in Northumberland and attaining teaspoonfuls of paradise at the cottage, otherwise decried modern society. And this is a quote from Gray. As if anything could be good that led to telephones and cinematographs and large cities and the Daily Mail. So, you may find it hard to believe, but this, uh, this uh, book of diplomatic history, which is not my core subject, I have to say, um, was something I could hardly put down. I just found it absolutely fascinating. And it's also very, very silkily written. Um, the guy's a good storyteller. Uh, it's long and therefore pretty detailed, but it's not overly detailed. And the reason it's so long is because Gray had such an extraordinarily varied life. I mean, he first went into the Foreign Office in 1892. The key question to me, from both a Scottish point of view and a Russian point of view, is did he provoke the war or did he do all he could to prevent it? On honourable terms. Of course, the traditional explanation is that his diplomacy um, put Britain in a position where war was inevitable on the basis of the violated Belgian Treaty. Now, of course, the fact that the lamps are going out all over Scotland is directly due to the fact that we have a, a local government here in Holyrood which has absolutely no respect whatsoever for treaties, including the Treaty of Union of 1707. So there's a resonance here. It really was the case, and I'm convinced of it having read this book, that Sir Edward Grey essentially took Britain to war in defence of treaty obligations. And treaty obligations are important. They are one of the main sources of international law, and without international law, we have complete anarchy. It is well to remember that in the Middle Ages, the church was the overriding arbiter of law. Europe was, so to speak, a single legal system. I mean, Russia was outside it, of course. But anything under the, the purview of the Pope in the High Middle Ages was, um, you know, had a form of international law that was international only to Europe. Now, in, by 1914, of course, this was a much wider uh, concern. And it was absolutely essential that Britain played its proper part in upholding this. And it's essential that Scotland plays its part in upholding the British approach to the rule of law, i.e. respect for treaties, including the Treaty of Union. And I'm not going to go into that subject here because it's dealt with in my book, The Justice Factory. But the fact is that uh, one of the reasons why I found this so interesting was to see the respect with which um, statesmen like Grey treated the the treaties that uh, Britain had signed up to and were still operative. The treaty in question was an 1839 instrument between Britain and uh, several other powers in order to guarantee the, the neutrality of the new state of Belgium, which had been formed in 1830 after being detached from the Netherlands, and it was felt that it was likely that France might take it over, or try to. Now, rather like the SNP today, uh, treaty obligations appear to have had the status of um, dispensable uh, pieces of law in the German Imperial Cabinet Office, um, or really in the Kaiser's mind, which was actually the effective instrument. Two years ago, in an earlier stage of this set of book recommendations, 
uh, when they were in print. I reviewed a number 38 in the series, of which this is number 59, the book written by the Chancellor of Germany, Bethmann Hollweg, the man who took the decision to violate Belgian neutrality. And the book is called Reflections on the War, and I picked out um, a passage describing Bethmann Hollweg's meeting with the British ambassador, that's the guy who Otti is referred to as being sent to deliver the ultimatum, um, a guy called Sir Edward Goshen, on the night uh, of August the 4th. The German foreign minister, Gottlieb von Jagau, had previously rejected the ultimatum. Sir Goshen asked Bethmann Hollweg, as head of the Reich government, whether or not he would overrule his foreign minister. And this is what Bethmann Hollweg writes about um, that request in his book. This is from the horse's mouth, so to speak. On my refusing to accept the ultimatum, the ambassador asked whether, supposing war to his deep regret finally decided on, we could not have before parting a private and personal conversation as to the awful situation in which the world found itself. I at once agreed and asked the ambassador to dinner. I then went on to speak in very strong terms of the world disaster that I could see would necessarily follow the entry of England into the war, and after Sir Edward had more than once brought up the question of Belgian neutrality as the deciding point, I responded impatiently that compared with the fearful fact of an Anglo-German war, the Treaty of Neutrality was only a scrap of paper. That is the very famous uh, comment, the dismissal um, of treaty obligations, a scrap of paper. The expression was perhaps an indiscretion, but my blood boiled at his hypocritical harping on Belgian neutrality, which was not the thing that had driven England into war, and at his complete lack of perception that an English declaration of war must destroy so much that was of value in the world that a violation of Belgian neutrality was of comparatively little weight. That's page 158 and 9 in his book, if you want to look it up. Now, the thing is that in 1914, the Reich had something in common with Scotland today in the sense that uh, the military were in charge, and Scotland's the militants, but uh, one way or another they take pride in trampling over inferior concerns in the rush to achieve their geopolitical ambitions. And in fact, this, in the end, was the gist of Gray's uh, comments, we'll come to that right at the end of this, uh, after the war about Germany and the question of war guilt. But I just want to quote Bethman briefly on this point. Quote, military opinion held that a condition of success for the Western offensive was passage through Belgium, i.e. the Schlieffen plan. Here in the political and military interests came into sharp conflict. The offence against Belgium was obvious, and the general political consequences of such an offence were in no way obscure. In other words, they knew what they were letting themselves in for. The chief of our general staff, General von Moltke, was not blind to this consideration, but declared that it was a case of absolute military necessity. I had to accommodate my view to his. Key sentence. It would have been a heavy burden of responsibility for a civilian to have thwarted a military plan that had been elaborated in every detail and decided to be essential. And there you basically have it. The military trumped civilian considerations, just in the same way that in Scotland today the militants in the SNP trump the people who believe in the respect for the rule of law. Hence the subtitle of my book, Can the Rule of Law Survive in 21st Century Scotland? Anyway, the man who had to meet this uh, militant military militancy <laughs> head on the civilian who had to do it was Sir Edward Grey. He was... Um, a foreign affairs specialist from 1892, although when he first started foreign affairs he said he knew nothing about it. He's a foreign affairs specialist from 1892 and in government as foreign secretary from 1905 until he left in December 1916, nearly blind. In the end he couldn't really work properly. 
There was an awful lot of stuff, there was things about the Boer War, imperialism, all sorts of interesting themes. There was also quite a bit about Russia, which was also very interesting, because of course Russia was a partner of Britain in the war, and it was Gray who negotiated the Mutual Assistance Agreement in 1907. But he was appointed just shortly after, I mean this will give it a, uh, an idea of the timescale, he was appointed just shortly after the Tsar had, had squeezed out of him the October Manifesto in 1905 by the riots and general disorder the country fell into at the time of the First Revolution. He left government at the very end of 1916, 11 years later, almost to the, or exactly to the day, I think, and uh, when the Tsar was about to go. It was only six days after Gray left the government that uh, Rasputin was murdered. And it was just another two months before the Tsar was no longer Tsar. He was just Citizen Romanov. And that's not the only reason I enjoyed this book. The other is it's just very well written. As I said at the beginning, it's, uh, the guy can pace a narrative and it was, it's also well published. There wasn't a single typo that I noticed in this whole book. Now that is almost unheard of. So well done to Alan Lane. Uh, I'm just going to concentrate on two things, um, both of which are related. The first one is this uh, business of how the war started, and the second one, which is, as I say, related to that, is who really was responsible for it? Well, you know, was this war guilt business fair? Now, the interesting thing is that from really the time of the publication of the war guilt clause, in uh, 1919, most of Europe and, and the large large sections of, of Britain were very much against this. The, the whole idea that there was this mad hue and cry to hang the Kaiser was, was something that uh, certainly was put out by the Daily Mail and the popular press in the immediate aftermath of the end of the war, but it very quickly died down. There was no appetite for that particularly. And everybody started to say, oh, you know, actually it was Austria who um, really started it because of their unbending attitude to Serbia after the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand in Bosnia uh, at the end of June. And then other people said, well, the Tsar had a lot to do with it. And then they were not wrong there. He was culpably weak and indecisive and also under the control of his generals, not under control, but he allowed himself to be persuaded by the generals. And he had absolutely nobody to discuss things with or, or, or um, no kind of... He, did, he didn't really have anybody in the position that Bethmann Holweg was in Germany. And in fact, his most intimate confidant in these matters, as far as I can gather from what I've read about this period of Russia, is, is his mother. And then, of course, there were the British people who blamed... Britain, for not having shown the Kaiser the big naval stick early enough. And there are some people who say, as I mentioned at the beginning, that Gray was, was responsible because he egged France on to attack Germany. Now that's one thing that just this, when you read this book, you realise that is just nonsense. Anyway, for long enough there was the view that the war was sort of everybody's fault. They tried to pin it on Germany, but it really was everybody's fault. Now, the, uh, six years ago we had the centenary of the outbreak of the war and there was a torrent of books written about it and an awful lot of discussion, many radio programmes that I heard, including Michael Portillo's excellent series on the outbreak of the war. And we've evolved into a different sort of world now in which nothing is anybody's fault. So now the war just, like, happened, just sort of evolved out of nothing. Um, and, in fact... There's a fellow called uh, Sir Christopher Clarke who wrote a book called The Sleepwalkers. He's the Regis Professor of History at Cambridge University. I've published a very well-received book with that title. Now, I've not read that book, but I have read another book of his, The Iron Kingdom, uh, The Rise and Downfall of Prussia, 1600 to 1947, and it's a fantastic book. It's a thematic rather than a narrative history, but it's extremely interesting, and... I would be very much disposed. That is uh, 10 o'clock, in case you're wondering. BBC News. But uh, anyway, I'd be very much disposed to believe what he says, that, you know, it was sort of nobody's fault. It was just uh, they bumbled into it. However, 
Just up the road from Cambridge works Professor Otty at the University of East Anglia, and he has persuaded me that it really was the Germans' fault and that the war guilt thing is not an unreasonable proposition. I mean, the way it was done in Versailles with the absurd, which even Gray very strongly criticised, the absurd level of reparations and all that sort of vindictive French Clemenceau uh, revanchist kind of approach to the thing um, is a separate issue. But the fact is, the one piece in the mechanism, if you like to put it like that, because it was very much a mechanism, it was sort of, everything was all official, it had to this mobilise, then they had to mobilise, and then the timetable, railway timetable, A.G.B. Taylor used to say, etc., 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 and you needed a split pin in there to just break if you hit something solid, like a, in a prop in a boat. You, you need something to give. And the thing that should have given but didn't give was Germany's uncompromising support for anything that Austria was prepared to do to thrash Serbia for having apparently had involvement in a murder of one of its statesmen in Bosnia. Now, that is the sort of situation in which you'd expect a country to say, well, hang on, let's see what goes here, because, you know, this is going to have terrible consequences. They all knew that. Uh, there's no specific obligation to, to assist Austria, and in fact, to a certain extent, you could argue that because of their close relationship, there was a certain obligation to give wise counsel to a close friend and say, look, hang on, just restrain yourself, let's lie down and think about this for a bit, which they didn't do. And the reason for this is that the Kaiser wanted it. It's not as if the German people were clamouring for war. And Kaiser Wilhelm II was a precious, bull-headed, inadequately socialised, but over-empowered hooligan. Something approaching 50 million Europeans paid either directly or indirectly with their lives for his um, murderous oafishness. While he just went and chopped wood in a country estate in Holland for the rest of his life. Perhaps the most graphically uh, described aspect of this whole situation is the extent to which this war really did come out of a blue sky. Just a month before the outbreak of hostilities in the early July, relations between Britain and Germany were very good. The whole arms race, naval arms race, you know, the dreadnought, competitive dreadnought building had died down basically because the Germans had run out of money to compete with it because they, they were frightened about rising Russian and French um, military expenditure, which of course was on armies, so they put all their money into the army. Um, and for a couple of years, the, the, the German naval building program had really languished, so Britain was fine with that. We had no quarrel with Germany, Germany had no quarrel with Britain. And there were all sorts of other things going on. I made a note of a couple of things here. I mean, um, Gray's private secretary, William Tyrrell, had been partly educated in Germany, and he was raised by marriage to some senior well-placed Germans, including Prince Blücher, descendant of the Waterloo Blücher. Between them, they planned to engineer a rapprochement between the two countries by, so to speak, nobbling the Kaiser. They had the wind at their backs. Professor Otte notes, three days before Sarajevo, Gray explained his thinking to the British ambassador in France. We're on good terms with Germany now, and we desire to avoid a revival of friction with her, and we wish to discourage the French from provoking Germany. The German government responded by saying that they were very anxious to be on good terms with England. All was fine. Then Sarajevo. And nobody took it very seriously, according to Professor Otte a diplomatic historian by speciality, so you can probably believe the guy. There were only two countries, two places, where the outrage was taken seriously. One was in Vienna, and the other was the British Foreign Office. And I quote again from Prof Professor Otto, he realised the seriousness of the situation from the moment the first news reached London. A week later, he summoned the German ambassador, uh, Prince Karl Max Lichnowsky, who actually turns out to be one of the heroes of this story, 
He was a Catholic landowning aristocrat from Bohemia who'd also served in the Habsburg um, diplomatic service, but he was sent in 1912 to London, and that was about the time the naval arms race was winding down, it has to be said, but nonetheless, the relations between the countries dramatically improved. So Gray said to Lichnowsky, who, you know, as I say, the two of them personally got on well, quite out from Lichnowsky being popular in the diplomatic circuit in London, uh, you know, we've got to solve this Balkan crisis between Britain and Germany, and they'd done this before, uh, not just in the Balkans, but also the French and crisis in West Africa and things like that. And he put the same point um, about restraint and everything to Count Benkendorf, who was the Russian ambassador to London, and incidentally a cousin of Prince Lichnowsky. How nice. Gray said to Lichnowsky, look, as, as long as he's demands are reasonable, and Austria produces some kind of proof of the fact that there's Serbian involvement in events in Bosnia, then, you know, we've got a basis for talking, and Gray's whole policy was to get a sort of four-power conference together to try and thrash, thrash things out in a civilised atmosphere in some smart location where everybody would be falling asleep with the amount of brandy they had after dinner, and things would be smoothed over. And a fantastic crisis in world history would be averted. And the interesting thing is that Gray was well aware of the gravity of what was going to happen. That he, that there could be no doubt, he said it so often. But at one point he said to the Austrian ambassador, when trying to make this point that, you know, like you've got to be a bit moderate with these people, he says that the war would, would revolve, and I'm quoting here, such an interference with trade that it would be accompanied or followed by a complete collapse of European credit and industry. There speaks the representative of a nation of shopkeepers. Well, and that's cool, because shopkeepers want to keep their, everything peace and quiet, keep their customers happy and trade moving along, whereas militants want to smash the shop windows, so to speak. But it was not until the 24th of July, when the outbreak of war, sort of ten days away, that Gray actually told the Cabinet Nobody thought this was important. Eventually he said, look, there's something going on here. The point, the point is the Cabinet, being preoccupied with the crisis in Ireland, home rule means Rome rule, etc., etc., etc. So they had, they had like a, you know, a week and a bit's notice before they actually found themselves at war in the greatest war Britain had ever been involved in to that date. And, you, it, you know, like talk about coming out of a blue sky on a hot summer's day, it's um, quite striking, that. And, and Gray was a sort of shopkeeper himself, in the sense that he was a director of the, the North Eastern Railway Company, which ran past uh, his estate in Northumberland. But he said to them that the general European war would, would, would leave the continent, quote, exhausted and impoverished, with industry and commerce destroyed and capital ruined. The consequences would be social and political collapse. Then the day after he addressed the cabinet, the Serbians made a, a very conciliatory reply to Austria, but it didn't comply with every single last um, detail, and so the Austrians were determined to go and punish them by crushing Serbia. And of course, Russia, Serbia's Russia's out. Couldn't, they couldn't stand by where their, their client was crushed. I mean, you know, given a, a, a couple of lashes with a big stick, maybe, but not crushed, and the Austrians were determined to crush them. And the Germans are going to stand by Austria. And here is where the story gets... Well, I think, I mean, if, if, this is, if this book is correct, then I think the war guilt uh, thing is proved, because here was the point at which the people in Berlin really started to monkey around. They didn't just say to Austria, you can do what you like. They also stopped telling Lichnowsky in London what they were planning. Not only that, they appeared not to be listening to his dispatches to them. The result of which was that they just gave up on diplomacy with the main, you know, Bethman Holweg said, you know, the great catastrophe if England joins in. Well, like, talk to England then, but they didn't. It's not as it kept in the dark, his dispatches were ignored, as I say, and frankly, I think that is where the real guilt lies, because... Uh, he was trying to tell them that, you know, Britain is serious, we, we um, will go to war, and they just weren't listening. This is the other issue that's of importance to me, because, of the, you know, the war guilt thing. 
I'm writing Russia and the Rule of Law, and the outbreak of the First World War was one of the most catastrophic events in Russian history, eventually, because it spawned the revolution, it spawned the Civil War, it spawned the Red Terror, it spawned Lenin, Stalin. I mean, you know, it makes the, civil, uh, the, makes the First World War look like small beer by comparison, a catastrophe that was exceeded in Russian history only by the Mongol invasion. Who really started it? Because the, the, the Tsar undoubtedly had some role in it, but I've come to the conclusion here that really the thing, the reason it got out of hand was because of the irresponsible attitude of the German government when the civilians allowed the militants to rule, the militants were under control of the Kaiser, and the Kaiser didn't, was just reckless. It's my ratio dissidendi. But Gray had an interesting point on this, because he didn't only blame the Kaiser. And I think he's right in this. The Kaiser was the symbol of this, the Kaiser was the man who implemented it, but he wasn't the only person concerned with this thing. The fact is, there was an entire culture of what he calls Prussian militarism. And Professor Otti says this, and he's quoting Gray here, the ideals of right and wrong and good faith in treaties and the other things that make for humanity and civilization will all be subordinated. That is, if the barbarian impulse in Germany is allowed to triumph. If Germany were to become a democratic country, this is a quote again, a democratic country, that would in itself be some security. And present she is, in effect, a military despotism. Indeed, Gray attributed the war to the Junker class, the crown prince, and others. I mean, there's a list of them. They seem to have overridden wiser heads. There were, he explained to Walter Hines Page, the American ambassador, two Germanys, the Germany of men like ourselves, men like Lichnowsky and Jagau, and a Germany of men of the war party. The war party has got the lead. That's the first one. And the second one, on page 625 is very short, and early in 1918, he was out of office then, but reflecting on all this, particularly because that year, early, still in the course of the war, Prince Lichnowsky had written a memorandum essentially saying that it was Prussian militarism and the performance of the German government when he was ambassador in London that had brought the war about. It was a very courageous thing to do in Germany. Well, I'd have thought that uh, he could lay himself open for terrible punishment for that, but anyway, he did. He published it. And Gray wrote a little memo which said, I've never had any qualms of conscience as to, make, as to my motives and intentions. I used to torture myself by questioning whether by more foresight or wisdom I could have prevented the war. But I've come to think that no human individual could have prevented it. Nothing could have prevented it except a change of the Prussian nature. So what exactly is Prussian militarism? To get a semi-official answer to that, I turned to Christopher Clark, uh, his book The Iron Kingdom, which I referred to earlier on, and he says on page 603 that the Prussian army remained a Praetorian guard under the personal command of the king, largely shielded from parliamentary scrutiny. Now, he's referring here to the, the late 19th century, and this... Um, really was the, the way in which things worked under Kaiser Wilhelm. And I turned over to page 604, and I found this passage, which I think is absolutely key. The Prussian-German military system remained a foreign body within the German constitution, institutionally sealed off from the organs of civil governance and ultimately responsible only to the emperor himself who came to be known from around 1900 in general parlance as the Supreme Warlord. The result was a perennial uncertainty about the demarcation between civil and military authority. This was Prussia's most fateful legacy to the new Germany. I'm going to just end with two uh, small points. One is really slightly off the subject. Um, <clears throat> but in December 918, they, there was what they called the Khaki election. There were, well, the, there's a new franchise. A lot of the soldiers now had the vote, etc., etc., etc. 
and the country returned the coalition government again uh, in almost overwhelming numbers. There was hardly any opposition left. This was a potentially very destabilizing situation. Now, I mention it because that is the situation we have in Scotland at the moment, where there's no effective opposition in Parliament. It's a unicameral Parliament anyway, so there's not even another House. His observations on the situation in 1918, which didn't last, unfortunately in Scotland they are lasting, uh, because the way uh, the Parliament was structured, as discussed in the Justice Factory, but I won't go into that here, he says that the 1918 election had resulted in the return of an abnormal House of Commons. It's, it's quite right, because it soon was reverted to come and go between the various sides, unlike this Parliament here. This is not a healthy state of things in time of peace, Gray wrote. Parliament might atrophy, and confidence in parliamentary and constitutional methods be undermined. This is our present danger, and it is real and serious. And we're experiencing it here right now. For if the House of Commons loses its independence and becomes nothing but a creature, an instrument of the government, exactly as happening in Holyrood right now, it will cease to be what it has hitherto been, the greatest guardian of personal liberty and bulwark against revolutionary violence that has ever evolved in any country. So, we're vulnerable there. And you can thank Donald Dewar for the structure of this parliament but I will not go into that. I have to save your curiosity for the Justice Factory. And finally, this is a much nicer point, Lichnowsky left London, of course, on the 4th of um, August, when the ultimatum was rejected. But so highly was he thought of that he was given a military guard of honour on his way to the boat train. And it's nice to think that they might well have played the German imperial anthem, out of respect for him. There'd be no singing, of course, it would just be a band. And, of course, the German national anthem was exactly the same as the British national anthem, and had been since 1791, as I describe at the beginning of my first short in this series uh, about the Germanic Isle. So, from 1791 to 1918, both the Kingdom of Prussia, then Imperial Germany, and the Kingdom of Great Britain, and after 1801, Great Britain and Ireland, saluted to the same tune, and here it goes. <laughs>